It's time for a new evolution in raising golfers, one that doesn't involve headaches, tears, or heading down the path of unknown. Whether you're trying to introduce children to the game of golf, help them play competitively, or play at a collegiate level, you're in the right place. This show is for any parent, player, or coach who wants to build a better team at home and on the golf course. This is the Raising Golfers Podcast. All right. Hello, everyone. Hope you all had a great weekend. Got to watch Super Bowl Sunday yesterday. Exciting times. And uh, I'm also excited for this conversation today. So today we're going to talk about play to learn and also just a little bit better understanding of learning itself and how children learn and junior golfers learn. And today's guest is going to be Michael Hebron. And he has received over 25 awards in coaching, including National PGA Teacher of the Year. In 2013, Michael was inducted into the PGA America Hall of Fame. And in 2019, he was elected into the World Golf Teachers Hall of Fame. He has been coaching golf for a while. He knows his stuff. He's very well educated, very well known in the golf industry and has a lot of knowledge to share on today's episode. And if, you, if they go down to train, it's a much different mindset than when they're down there practicing and they don't like the outcome. If they're down there training, they're much more acceptable of the outcome that's that's taking time to grow and develop. And the word difference instead of better is very important because if I miss a putt and I make it, it wasn't better, it was different. It was higher, it was lower, and that's how you're going to learn. What was different about that, not what was better about it. Michael believes that there are many good reasons to study and research the brain's connection to the nature of learning, and they arrive every day in every learning environment. Michael's been researching the brain's connection to learning with lots of help from award-winning educators and scientists for over two decades. What happens after a lesson is more of his concern. He's also written six books and over 100 instruction articles. Michael's been invited to speak all over the world And I feel fortunate that he was so kind to come and join us on the Raising Golfers podcast today. Michael, welcome to the Raising Golfers podcast. I'm I'm really excited for a conversation. And some of the things that we're going to talk about is some of the neuroscience, neurolearning things that you have been specializing in. And then also some of those paradoxes around learning. And I love some of the stuff you post on social media. And it kind of resonates with a lot of things that we promote here on the podcast and have people come on discussions and just, and topics and mostly related around junior golf. So we'll touch on those things and a little bit about child development and then how to best speak with your junior golfer who plays in competitions. So again, welcome Michael and appreciate you joining. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, one of the reasons I, uh, do a fair amount of these is I always come away with, uh, I've learned something today. So thanks for having me. And uh, uh, the golf industry should thank uh, you for doing these kind of things and trying to uh, share information for people to think about. That's how I, I like to frame what I say is, uh, is just think, give people some things to think about. And uh, so uh, look forward to our conversation. That's kind of you to say that. Yeah, I appreciate that. So I think the first thing I want to touch on are some of those paradoxes. You just posted these a few days ago. And the first one was, some things are learned better when we do not try to teach them. If maybe you can extend a little bit on that and and kind of have the the idea of a junior golfer in the the back of your mind when, I guess, speaking about this paradox. Okay, we have a, we we call it youth golf in our place. We have an 18 hole golf course and a uh, a nine hole part three golf course that I call the learning links where you play to learn. Learning is a natural predestined, uh, it's actually, learning is a survival skill. 50 species a day become extinct on Earth. Not to get fancy with uh, scientific information, but, and we're still here after millions of years, Mm -hmm. not speaking, because we are designed to learn. We're not designed to miss putts. We're not designed to have car accidents. We're not designed to fail tests. We're designed to succeed. So the, the the metaphor of some things are learned better when we don't try to teach them is based on that we're natural learners. Uh, for instance, you could tell somebody that's a steering wheel. 
That's a brake pedal. That's a gas pedal. Could you tell somebody how much pressure to put on them? So you say, well, move it, move it this way, move it that way, do this, do that. So you're actually creating a learning environment, not, just, not a teaching environment. Teaching environments normally have a goal. And there's a specific place they're going where a learning environment is open-ended. For instance, anybody that's played basketball, when we first started to play, we didn't know the basket was 10 feet high. So that's an exact measurement, exact measurement that we had no idea existed. But we figured out 10 feet worth of force. And through self-discovery, figured out 10 feet, as opposed to trying to teach somebody that. So when, when a golfer comes to us, no matter what age span, we, we, we tell the children they have nothing wrong with their golf swing. They have nothing wrong with anything. They just have things that aren't developed yet. Mm -hmm. If people are in a situation where they think things are wrong, it's a much, it's a much different mindset than if they're on a journey of development. Mm -hmm. And that they're not learning to do things better they're learning to do things different. In fact, the if you were on the putting green with kids and they were putting, and they were just playing around putting, and the, the putt they miss is actually the teacher for what to do different on the next putt. Mm. So it's very valuable when we... I don't know if that's explaining what, what I mean by it's better to set up a situation where things are learned better when you try to teach them it is and you know it's the i think it's a very interesting point because i guess my next fault question to you from what your experience has been is do you think that adults that'd be again coaches and parents do you think that they sometimes over instruct and over teach some of these things about maybe why that kid missed the putt or why the ball may not be lined up at the hole do you think that we as adults sometimes go a little bit too overboard in that area well, I, I'm not here to, to judge anybody, but certainly at every level of sharing information, they, uh, when it's done in a way that's not brain compatible, we're not, we're not mm -hmm. really coaching the person. We're coaching their past experiences. There is no new learning. If you've ever said to somebody, could you say that again for me? I didn't quite understand. The reason we said that is it didn't attach to something we couldn't that we could relate to. It doesn't even have to be from the same subject. So to frame information with metaphors and stories, uh, if we're going to talk about putting, we might ask the child to make the ball go too far, make it go too short, make it go left, make it go right. Now, that'll help them find the middle. The brain works with reference points. We know chocolate because we know vanilla. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a, a parent or a, uh, a, a coach, um, I suggest to our staff to ask the child, what could have been different about that? Uh, what, did the ball, what did the ball just do? And they would explain what it just did, or it went to the left. We might say to them, well, why does a basketball come straight up? Well, it comes straight up because that's the way the floor is looking. So why mm. do you think if you'd hold the putter up and see it has a flat face? So what, well, why do you think the ball went over there? Which way do you think the face was facing? Oh, it was facing over there. This is well, do something different. And that's how we would approach sharing information. We would set up a situation where they would self-discover, guided self-discovery, where they're bringing them to their own conclusions about things. You know, why do you think the ball went over there? Why do you think it went too high? Why do you think it went too low? I like that, yeah. I mean, some of the things we talk about with some of the guests I've had on the podcast you know, we say, like, I've had guests say, you know, it's not so much about educating so much about teaching, it's more about involving them in the process. And it sounds like the environment that you set up there is really involving them in the learning aspect of the game, which I, yeah. I really like that. And I think that's great. Teaching environments are very different than learning environments. 
you, you a learning environment. Uh, things are on a journey. There's no end point. It, it, it's always it's always going forward and going backward. I might ask I might ask to uh, to a, to an adult I might say our business is consistent. Are the best businesses consistent? Or to a children, if they knew different athletes' name, say, is LeBron James consistent? And they might want to say yes. And you'd point out to them that some nights he has 10, and some nights he has 30, and some nights he has 20. But he's always adjusting. Great companies aren't consistent. They adjust to the bad poor year or the poor product better than a competitor. Consistency doesn't exist. Nobody on the first key can, key can tell you what they're going to shoot. You can't control the outcome of a shot. It's impossible. If they could, the pros wouldn't miss fairways and greens. So what you do is you prepare yourself before the shot or before the swing. You decide what to do. Pick your club. And then when you stand over the golf ball, you just play golf and, and, accept, and accept where the ball went. The ball, it wasn't a, a good shot or a bad shot. It was a shot with left, a shot with then right, a shot with then long, or a shot that went short. You don't label it as, oh, that was bad or that was good. Just say, oh, that, that went too far. Let me, let me do something different. And we do our best to make them feel, uh, I don't know if we're trying to make them feel smart, or we're trying to make them feel capable. Our job is to make them feel capable, in our opinion, that, 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 they, that they participate in the process. We don't call them lessons. We call them sessions. Because mm -hmm. the lesson is what they take away. They're with you for an hour or two or all day long. When children leave school in June, that's the lesson. They're leaving with the lesson. It wasn't what's going on in the classroom. That was a session. That was an exchange mm -hmm. of information. That was giving them something to think about, information to do things with. You know, we might tell uh, children, what do you think you'd have to do to make the ball go, you're standing at home play. What do you think you'd have to do to make the ball go third base? What would you have to do to make the ball go to first base? What would you have to do to make the ball go to second base? And sometimes they come up with some answers that are very acceptable, or they come up with the answers that they would have to rethink. So you, you just said you would do A, B, C to make the goal go to first base. And the coach knows that's not quite accurate. So let's, let's do what you just said, A, B, or C. Oh, it went to first base. So you get them to reevaluate. We do a lot of having them give us a, uh, a lesson. Well, I don't play golf. Well, what are your ideas? Or even if somebody that plays golf. We start off with what they know and move forward from that. Does that have to mm -hmm. be adjusted? Or they have pretty good insights, but they're not quite doing it. So we become a referee of what's relevant, a traffic cop for ideas. We don't see ourselves as, as, as giving answers. It's guided self-discovery, guided coaching. Phil Jackson used to do that with the Lakers the first month. He, he wouldn't call timeouts. He let the players decide when to call a timeout. Because he knew down the road, deeper into the season, they would have to be making decisions. Kids are on the golf course by themselves, or anybody's on the golf course by themselves. So they have to be their own best coach, and their, own, their own decision makers on what to do. So that's kind of how we started. Mm. I have often brought a, uh, if I'm coaching an adult, then there might be a little one on the range with grandparents or parents, all five or six years old. I'll walk down and I, I, I'll ask the parent, can I borrow the child for your son or daughter for a few minutes? They'll say yes. And I, I ask the child, I want you to be my coach. So the face lights up a little bit. And I'll stand there and I'll, I'll make a, I said, I want you to tell me which one of these act motions you like. 
and I'll make a very flat swing, and then I'll make a very upright swing, and then I'll make a swing on plane. And I'll say, well, I, I, I like number three. And they never, they never say number one or number two. They always say number three. And they don't know anything about golf. Because balance and timing and rhythm looks OK. They may not have to say it, but it looks all right. Mm. Somebody that never ice skated before or never skied before or never played golf before to those settings and say, you know, pick out how you'd like to look like one day. They pick out orthodox. Jeez, I'd like to ski like that guy all day. So they don't need a teacher <laughs> per se. They need a referee of what's relevant. They need a traffic cop for ideas, all the information that's out there, good, bad, or indifferent. They don't have work. From our perspective, we're giving, we're helping them develop tools to evaluate themselves and the information, even with the young ones. They, and we start with the golf club. We'll say, you know, why do we shoot basketballs up? Because the net's up. Why is pool a horizontal game? Because the table's up. Why do we, why do we play croquet vertically? Because the stick is vertical. Well, golf clubs, golf clubs kind of look like the roof of a house or a hockey stick. Okay. So right. the idea is to work backwards from that. That you're learning what to do with the tool. We say it has three parts: a shaft, a head, and a face. Where do you want the shaft? Where do you want the head? Where do you want the face when you're playing golf? And that depends on the shots you want to play. I, I might ask a child to use a paintbrush. I said, Did you learn how to paint? Or did you learn the rules of the paintbrush? Oh. I learned what to do with a paintbrush. I learned what to do with a knife. I learned what to do with a steering wheel. So we want people to learn what to do with the club. I like to ask somebody to hold the club out. And I say, T turn the club face open. Turn the club face square. And turn the club face closed. That told your hand what to do. The tool. We didn't learn to use our bodies. We learned to adapt to the situation. If we didn't have stairs, probably wouldn't have learned to pick up our thing. So right. if, if, if you don't like playing with your right arm is, kind of figure out what to do different with the club. We go forward with the, the swing model is the golf course, not Tiger. It's not uh, Chambly. It's not anybody else. Everything works backwards from the environment. Every business in the world works backwards from the customer. We dress one way because of the environment. We dress another way because of the environment. Mm -hmm. The golf course environment tells you it's an eight iron. The golf course environment tells you where to play the ball. The golf course environment tells you what club to use. The golf course environment tells you what size swing to use. So we're very lucky to have the par three golf course. And we get them up there right away. You go to a basketball. Right. Court. We also have a ping pong table. We also have four by four boards for them to walk on for balance. The ping pong table is a must. They learn what to do with the face. They learn their timing and rhythm. We play cornhole for the rhythm of their motion and distance influence. We, we, we try to get them to understand when they walk in the house with a book or a sweater, they don't miss the couch. They already know how to do these things. We say the basic idea in basketball is shoot up. The basic idea in golf is swing the way to the club. We start the kids or a tour player or a, a fine amateur or a weekend amateur. We start with the putting stroke. Then let me see you putt. Some may putt like that, and some may putt like this. So when the kids are putting like this, I say, what do you think a coach would like about that? And they may say something. So what the coach would like about it was that it was a one, that it was a smooth. If somebody coached putted like this, we would say, 
what do you think could be different about that? And they would say whatever. Say, well, hold the club in one hand and make a stroke. And we would ask the child, well, what was different about that than this? And, oh, one was smooth and one kind of had a little jump in it. We call that an extra employee. This had an extra employee in it. We want this feeling in every golf swing. A putting swing and a driving swing take the same amount of time from start to impact. Very interesting insight. The putting swing and the driving swing take the same amount of time, 1,001, 1,002. So we want them to carry that in to their whole game. So we start, we educate them about the golf club and we educate them about how the golf course is the environment that we're going to use our skills on and the golf course is telling us what to do. We talk a lot about safety. We talk a lot about the hardest thing for children to do is say no. They think they won't have friends and their friends ask them to do something that they're not happy with. Hardest thing for you kids to do is going to say no. See you guys tomorrow. That's not, that's not something I want to do. They think they're going to lose friends. So we try to, from a very young age, get them to be independent thinkers, think for themselves, ask questions. Ask them between session, what did they take away from the last session? That's very general information, but perhaps you could get something from it. Yeah, no, I mean, it all sounds really good. I think the biggest takeaway I had from hearing what you said there was that you guys really ask a lot of questions and there's a lot of different types of skill development more than just picking up a club and trying to swing it from day one. Like you said, the ping pong table, the two by fours, even the uh, the cornhole, all those things I think are really important elements. And if you're a parent listening, I mean, some of these things you could even do, you could, you could involve your child in these things at home. And I think a lot of times as adults, you know, we get our kids into a sport, you know, let's just say it's golf or soccer or whatever. We try to go in too hard and, you know, maybe just have them focused on that one sport too early. But really, there's so many other skills to develop and learn from so many different things, whether it's playing another sport or just doing these other skills or other games or other activities that then will then click in later down the road and it can connect with what they're learning with the sport that you want them to play. And for us, you know, we're talking about golf. So like you said, the ping pong, pa uh, ping pong paddle, understanding how to control the face. And there's a lot of similarities to that with, with controlling the club face as well. So well, I really like all those things that you talked about. All the research says that they should play. Soccer will help putting. Putting will help foul shooting. Foul shooting will help skiing. It's all balanced timing and rhythm. There is no golf stuff. It's balanced timing and rhythm that they're bringing from their life to whatever sport and to get them mm. involved in everything. It's very important, young, and then pick one. Perhaps the value of a youth golf program is how many of the children in the program are playing golf when they're 35? How many are still playing? I think that if you really wanted to to uh, from a industry point of view, from a business point of view, you know, is this is this youth program creating lifetime golfers, or is it just filling some downtime in the afternoon for them? But right. And if you include, we call it. It says learn positive golf. Learn positive golf. Okay. Yes, I see it there. Learn positive golf. Learning card. Yes, this is the card that we give people to and the kids to fill out for their notes. We call it a learning card. And we call our program Positive Golf because we don't bring up anything. Their unintended outcome is actually the teacher for what to do different. They're important. And we introduce, I spent some time at, out at UCLA's learning lab with Dr. Borg, and he emphasized introducing Unintended outcomes when you're coaching is very important. Very important that they encode the differences. You know, uh, do it this way, now do it this way. Do it this way, now do it this way. So that the brain and the body knows the difference. That's we, interesting. We never bring up anything negative. 
I like that. Yeah, I think that's very important. I think that's good as well for just the uh, the positivity and the longevity of wanting to stay in the game, isn't it? Because I, I, I think that's just huge. And I think especially starting at a young age and, and just having that type of positive environment is just so important for the development of the kids. And and hopefully they end up playing golf when you check in with them all the way up to 35 and beyond that, right? The way would... the brain was information, it stores, it stores information by categories, trees or cars or whatever. It retrieves by differences. I know chocolate because I know vanilla. So I make a big emphasis on shying away from the word better. If I'm, if I'm training, I also use the word train, not practice. If a lawyer has a practice, a doctor has a practice, I want the kids to go down and train what they're going to put into practice on the golf course. Doctors have a practice after their training. And if, you, if they go down to train, it's a much different mindset than when they're down there practicing and they don't like the outcome. If they're down there training, they're much more acceptable of the outcome. That's, that's taking time to grow and develop. And the word difference, Instead of better is very important because if I miss a putt and I make it, it wasn't better, it was different. It was higher, it was lower, and that's how you're going to learn. What was different about that, not what was better about it. I love that's that. I think that's all. That's great. Huge. Yeah, I think that's really important. Yeah, I think it's really important. And again, I like just the questioning and the questions that you're asking. And then that really, you know, stimulates the, the student to actually think about what's happening and what is different about those outcomes. So I really like that. Yeah, I, I asked them all who's more important here today, me or you. And the, the Asian children tend to say me. The American <laughs> kids tend to say them. This is the answer <laughs> we want. The Asian children are raised in a, in, in a different way um, and, uh, than some American children. But I want the children to feel that they're important they, I am there for them, and or right. the program is for them, and that it's it's for their progress, not for our progress. No, I like that. Let's let's shift gears here a little bit. We got a lot of parents that listen to the podcast, and uh, a lot of them have kids that play competitive golf. And I, I've seen a few things you've talked about before. Maybe you can just kind of rattle these off because I think they're quite important points. But the first one is like, so it's how to say healthy things to children. And we'll start with competition. So what are some things to say to your children before a competition? Enjoy yourself. Have a good time. That's it. And what? That's, that's it. it. I like that. It. That's it. <laughs> and so then, now some of them caddy, maybe not all, some of them watch, but what would be some things to say or do during the competition as a parent? Depends on the parent. Some parents just caddy. Uh, I, we, in the Mets section, we don't allow, back east here, we don't allow parents to caddy. Uh, there's, there's just been over the years, uh, in past years, some some problems with parents on the golf court. Just caddy, you know, uh, don't don't coach, don't, it, it depends. If, if it's really an answer that I, I'm not sure I can give a general answer to, because it would depend on me knowing the parent. And I call them little league parents. You know, you really, you do your best, but they love their child. They think they're helping. They don't recognize that they're not. And uh, there's, there's not a lot you can do except for suggest just caddy. If, if they're going to be on their own one day, they might as well be on their own uh, from, uh, from a very guided, you know, you can guide them but uh, guide them in the, in the right direction without them. Uh, I, I once had a, a, a child who used to ask his buddy if he hit his, shot a particular score and he knew his parents wouldn't like, he would ask his buddy, can I go home with you tonight? And I didn't find that out until after uh, several years later. I mean, that must have been awful for that child to grow up in that house. Uh, it must have been very difficult. Uh, it took so, me a what while. would you say you should say after a competition? Then, what, what would be what would be advised to talk about, whether win or lose? I asked them what they, just... 
just uh, say, hey, uh, did you enjoy yourself? Tell me about the shots you liked. It took me a while to learn that. There was a time, we have a very large junior program. We have 800 kids in the program, in different, wow. different programs. There's a camp, there's a weekly visit, there's uh, part three programs, there's range programs. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really neat facility. Uh, it's in the town of Smithtown. It's a town golf course for the residents. So we have a lot of children every year and it uh, keeps us young. But uh, it took me a while to learn. At one time I was a very technical coach, uh, received recognition and awards for that approach. And then one day when I felt some of the people who had talent were reaching their potential, I said, what, what could I do different? And I realized that uh, I started studying I knew my subject, but I didn't know anything about how the brain learned. So I went to Harvard, took 90 hours of courses at Harvard, spent time at UCLA, took another 80 hours of courses at teaching with the Brain and Mind Institute, and started to study learning over the last 20 years. And people have to be, to learn, everything's emotional, birds fly, fish swim, people feel. Everything we do has an emotional component. I picked this shirt out because I liked it. It was an emotional decision. So everything we do, so it has to be a safe environment. Where a child, in a classroom, a child could stand up and give a silly answer without getting laughed at. Where a child, when they're, remember, nobody has is doing anything wrong with their golf swing. These are things that aren't developed yet. So you don't, there's nothing to talk about in a negative way. You always bring out what to do not how to do it. Maybe, do you think that club could come in higher or lower? Well, it probably could come in higher. Did you like that speed? Was it five miles an hour or 10 miles an hour? Don't say fast or slow, because that doesn't mean anything. Say, well, if that was 10 miles an hour, let me see five miles an hour. Metaphors and stories, always positive. Never ask what they shot unless they bring it up and asked them to tell you about their good shot. I learned that from Davis Love. When he was growing up, his dad always asked him, tell me about the good shots you hit, even if it was only one or three or four. And so but before any of this research was out there, his dad was a great coach if he handled it that way. Just tell me about the good shot. Those are the ones you want to do over. You can't, if I burn a pie, I'm fixing it, and I burn a pie, I can't fix it. That shot that you don't like can't be fixed. Fixing isn't learning. Do it different. Do it different the next time. Learn from it. There's nothing to fix. Nothing to fix. Also, let's say a child uh, has a good front nine and a bad back nine. How could it be the golf swing? A half hour ago, everything was fine. Something went on emotionally or in their brain different on the back nine or at that tournament after a couple of good tournaments. It wasn't the golf swing. It wasn't the golf swing. The golf swing is going to go up and down anyway. That's just, mm. we can't even sign our name the same way twice. The challenge yeah. is, when your golf swing is not quite right, to still be able to score halfway decent because your mindset is one of accepting the outcome and playing right. one shot at a time. This shot has no future has no past experiences, let's see what's going to happen. We can't control the outcome. We can only control standing over the ball calmly and making our golf swing. Right. Here's, here's, a, here's a question from, I, I get often from parents, and, and some parents have asked me to ask this on the podcast, is you know, how do you keep your junior golfer motivated maybe when they're not? And maybe that's whether it's going to practice, maybe that's whether it's going to play, and... I, I, I think maybe if you could answer this question without results necessarily in mind, but just how would you try to keep a junior golfer more motivated to stay in the game of golf for a long period of time or for a lifetime? I'd ask them why they're playing. I can't motivate them. You can only motivate yourself. So mm -hmm. why are you playing? One of the questions we ask is, uh, who's here that someday would like to play on their school team? Who's here 
as a recreation golfer, and who's here to just try out and see it. So they set up their needs of the program with those questions. Now, if somebody is said they want to play on the golf team, we would ask them if they feel they're doing what they should be doing to make the golf team. If somebody's here for to try it out, we might say, what, what, what are you liking about golf? You like being with your friends? You liking the idea of hitting a ball? What are you liking about golf? So by asking questions, you come up with a game plan to support their answers. Motivating somebody is supporting their needs. And I like that. Yeah. Support their answers. Not you got to this, you got to that. Johnny's hitting, doing this, and Joe's doing that. You're not doing this. That's not going to motivate anybody. I like you know, that too, because I think a lot of kids as well are particularly very honest. And so if you ask more questions to kids, you know, I think as adults, we sometimes are hesitant to ask kids questions for whatever reason. But if yeah. if you ask them questions, they're going to give you their honest answer. And so you're going to learn a lot about what their needs are to help them motivate them, which I like that. I really like that. You might even say, you know, OK, you want to be on your golf team someday. Someday, another one might say, well, some." I wanted this as a social business tool. And the other one said, well, I'm just here for the summer. Say, well, how best do you think I can help you accomplish that? How can our program help that? And an outsider might say, well, the kids aren't going to know. The children know. You know they, they know exactly. You know, how, how, how can we help you? Were you happy with your putting this week? Were you happy with your irons? Were you happy with your driver? And you ask them as opposed to the coach bringing up an evaluation, you ask them where they think they should be spending more time. So you talked about emotions uh, earlier and uh, about how we as humans are pretty much wired for emotion. How do you help a junior golfer embrace the ups and downs that they're going to go through during the process? Well, every child is different. and You kind of get to know a little bit about them. So as a general statement, you would, if you're embracing the ups and downs, that's the game. You know, uh, last week, a guy on the European tour shot 39-26 to finish third in the tournament in his last round. That's just golf. Mm. No, no t- we can't sign our name to it the same way twice. Golf is never the same. No shot, no swing has ever been the same. So when by getting them to understand that, and receive that, and until they do, they won't make the kind of progress they're capable of. And I've said that to mm-hmm. kids. I said, you know, you can have your high standards. I don't, I don't want you to drop your standard, but realize that you have to take the workable with the un, unintended outcome. Nobody can predict their score on the first tee. Nobody. So you're going out, and each each time, each time you address the golf ball. It's like baking a new pie. If you shoot 70, it was 70 apple pies you had to bake. 70 different times that you're playing golf, you're not playing golf swing. But you stand before the swing, you're kind of in your thought box. Vision 54, uh, Pia and Wynn have great insights into it. They call it just the think box. You pick the club, you decide what to do. You walk around and you stand in the play blocks and just play golf. You stay away from golf swing ideas, playing golf. Absolutely. I like that. I, I think, you know, a, a lot of things you shared today, and, and again, I, th- I think I'm going to go back to this, is just some of the biggest things that I take away is just how much more we have to ask questions of, of course, yeah. junior golfers, but also adults. And I, I like the way you use the words of basically it's not a teaching environment it's uh, you said it's a learning environment right yes. and you're not teaching them golf you're allowing the students to come in and feel competent and being able to achieve whatever it may be on that day right and so I, I think that's really important for not just parents but also coaches and anybody any adult adult involved in junior golf to better understand that and 
And those were some of the really big takeaways and, and all the details and metaphors you added to it really kind of helped paint the picture of what I think myself and the listeners want to hear and better understand about this process. And I think it's so important. Now, with that said, if people wanted to find out more about you and then some of the things that you have put together and been able to share, what would be where would be the best place to oh. find more information about what you're doing and uh, also maybe some of the books that you've 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 written as well? Just Google my name. I put stuff up on Facebook. Uh, the younger guys on the staff set me up with a Facebook account. I put stuff up on Facebook almost daily about coaching and learning and other things. And uh, just Google my name. Uh, I coach in Florida at the Wanderers Club in uh, West Palm Beach area. It's actually Wellington, suburb of West Palm Beach. And I'm on Long Island in the summers at Smithtown Landing. But uh, if they just Google my name, uh, something will come up. And, uh, and just to review, uh, we... Uh, we play to learn. Play stands for powerful learning about yourself. In a safe environment, students always first environment, safe, playful environment. I love that. And what are your final words of inspiration for raising golfers? Raise children with a moral compass, support self-discovery skills in your children, and tell you you love them every day. That's that's what will help them be golfers. Raise a child with a good moral compass that's self-sufficient, and you tell them you love them. Just that's great. I really like that. I really like that. Michael, it was a true pleasure and uh, honor to have you here on the podcast and just share so much information and um you know, I think what's what's great about this, not only just myself, but listeners, you know, we walk away kind of with a new perspective and kind of reflect on the things that we've heard from guests on the podcast. And then, you know, I'm ho I, I hope that we all can implement some of these things into what we do in our daily lives, whether you're a parent or a coach. And all the things you talked about today, I'm definitely going to take away, reflect on it and, and implement into the, what I do on a daily basis. And I'm sure the listeners appreciate the same. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. It was a true pleasure to have you. No, pleasure was mine. Thanks for asking me. Wow, what a great learning opportunity for us listening to this episode. I think my biggest takeaways were how we have a better understanding of how children learn and be able to adapt and build the environment for them to be in where they can all thrive. I also took away how much we have to ask questions, even to young children, and I think I've been guilty of this as well, and it's something I'm going to really work on. And if we want to help them, I believe from what Michael said, we need to have a better understanding of where they're coming from. I thought that was another great interview on the podcast. I'm sure there were many more things that you were able to take away from this episode. And again, I'm so happy that we were able to have Michael come on and share all that knowledge and information with us today. If you enjoy listening to our podcast and the information you got from this episode, do us a favor and continue to support us by hitting that subscribe button and giving us a five-star review. Your continued support will help us continue to grow and be able to interview some of the most experienced parents, coaches, and players in the golf industry to help you continue to raise your golfer to their full potential.